It's been a long road getting from there to here. It's been a long time. Hoo wee! It's good to be back. Hey guys. Tyler here. So, the Star Trek The Next Generation movies, we all remember them with varying degrees of fondness. Star Trek Generations, Star Trek First Contact, Star Trek Insurrection, Star Trek Nemesis, they're all somewhat divisive within the fandom. Translation, they kind of suck. Well, not all of them, but they're very flawed in ways that fans have been picking apart for over two decades. I've spent the better part of the past year analyzing the lore of Star Trek The Next Generation. I've showcased how the writing evolved over seven seasons and offered my opinions on the quality of many episodes. Towards the end of my most recent retrospective, I lamented that there were no more lands to conquer. Uh, I mean, no more episodes to review. And then I remembered, oh sh! They made four movies! Cut to black. In this video, I'd like to examine the four Star Trek The Next Generation feature films, analyzing their lore contributions and how they reflected the changing landscape of the film industry in the 90s and early 2000s. Let's get started. Before we dive in, I need to address the elephant in the room. <sighs> hey, Horton. So anyway, I have a new studio set up. So I was going to do this little studio tour as like a Patreon exclusive, but I figured, you know, I might as well do it for my whole audience. You know, you guys have supported me this long. Here, let's, let's do a studio tour. So, you know, we've got the, we've got the Pixar corner, right, with, uh, you know, Wally and Incredibles and, you know, Disney with like Groot and everything. The Star Trek shelves with the, the ships and DS9 characters and Communicator and... Uh, we got some little Metroid action uh, down here, uh, and then on the lower shelves we've got you know some some old toys from back in the day, you know some some uh, from the Kelvin timeline and everything. We got uh, Blade Whoa, Runner. What? Uh, um, in the fall of 1992, during TNG's sixth season, producer Rick Berman was approached by Paramount regarding a seventh Star Trek film with the original series cast having literally just signed off with Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country, Paramount wanted Star Trek VII to be a TNG vehicle. Berman and studio executives felt that the outing would be an opportunity to pass the baton, and in February 1993, the studio commissioned three writers to pin a couple Star Trek stories for this seventh motion picture installment. One draft written by former TNG writer-producer Maurice Hurley had Captain Picard recreate Captain Kirk on the holodeck to help solve a dilemma involving interdimensional aliens wreaking havoc by crossing into our realm. Simultaneously, a script by Ronald D. Moore and Brandon Braga which was ultimately greenlit, instead featured Kirk in the flesh, as well as, initially, the entire original series cast. For a time, Moore and Braga considered having the two Enterprise crews battle each other, but felt there was no way to make this happen without one of the crews looking like the bad guy. They ultimately returned to the initial idea of a mystery that spans two generations, using the character of Guinan as the link between both time periods. It was soon decided as well that the script would kill off Kirk, which became part of the fabric of the story and there was never a moment where it came into question. Even as late as December 1993, a year before release, the film's prologue featured Kirk, Spock, McCoy, Scotty, Uhura, Sulu, and Chekhov. Early drafts also featured large action pieces that were later removed. These included the Romulan attack on the Amargosa Observatory, and a battle between the Enterprise crew and Duras sisters in the jungles of Viridian III, likely cut for budgetary reasons. Eventually, the two producers chose to pare down the appearances of TOS cast members to two select cameos, besides William Shatner. A January 1994 draft featured Kirk, Spock, and McCoy in the prologue on the Enterprise B, but Leonard Nimoy and DeForest Kelly declined to appear, feeling their characters made sufficient exits in the undiscovered country. Nimoy was even offered the director's chair, having directed the third and fourth Star Trek movies 
but requested too many script changes for the producer's tastes. The final draft script was submitted in March 1994, featuring Scott, Chekhov, and Kirk. During pre-production, Berman battled with the studio over the budget, with the film's cost cut down to an estimated $35 million. Hopes of shooting on location in Hawaii and Idaho were dropped in favor of more local shoots in California and Nevada. TNG and DS9 veteran director David Carson was hired in place of Nimoy, with the film recruiting veteran cinematographer John Alonzo, DP on Chinatown and Scarface. Say hello to my little friend! And as for production design, Herman Zimmerman worked with Alonzo and illustrator John Eaves to refresh the aging sets, as well as design new Enterprise locations like Stellar Cartography. Among the modifications made to the Enterprise D bridge were additional computer stations, raising the captain's chair slightly, adding handrails, and repainting and recarpeting. Following the end of production, most of the Enterprise's interior sets were destroyed. Filmed during production on TNG's seventh season, Generations really is a passing of the baton. The prologue echoes sentiments shared by the franchise as far back as the Wrath of Khan, namely aging and the passage of time, which are ultimately some of the core themes of Generations itself. We open aboard, or actually outside, the Enterprise B, an Excelsior-class starship, which is a modified version of the actual Excelsior Studio model from the search for Spock. Immediately as Kirk, Scott, and Chekhov step on the bridge, we are greeted by several news reporters from various Federation-affiliated outlets, an early on-screen indication that human journalists are still employed in the 23rd century, and that the Federation has broadcast news media, which may or may not be state-owned. We meet Demora Sulu, daughter of Hikaru Sulu and flight controller of the Enterprise B. Tim Russ makes it <laughs> We ain't found shit makes another appearance as a human officer aboard the Enterprise after appearing in the season 6 TNG episode Starship Mine. We later learn in Star Trek Voyager, where Russ portrays series regular Lieutenant Tuvok, that Tuvok served under Hikaru Sulu aboard the USS Excelsior herself. The prologue also introduces us to the Nexus Energy Ribbon, though it goes unnamed until later in the film and fills in certain gaps in the history of the Elorian species. The Enterprise B helps rescue 47 Elorian refugees from the starship Lakul, presumably fleeing the destruction of their homeworld by the Borg Collective. Among the refugees are Guinan, who had visited Earth centuries earlier, as seen in Time's Arrow, and Generation's primary antagonist, Dr. Tolian Soren, played by Malcolm McDowell. After Kirk volunteers to make modifications to the Enterprise B's deflector dish on Deck 15, an energy discharge causes a hull breach, and Kirk is presumed dead. We transition into the film's 24th century time period and see Worf's promotion to Lieutenant Commander. This sequence serves as a nice breather after the action-packed prologue, as we're reacquainted with our favorite TNG characters' personality quirks, including Data's ongoing struggle to understand various aspects of the human emotions. The, of, <laughs> I couldn't decide the human condition or human emotions. Do something unexpected. Picard subsequently gets a horrifying report that his brother Robert and nephew René have died in a house fire. The experience of losing the closest person he had to a son, along with Picard's experience in the season 5 episodes Disaster and the Inner Light, are instrumental in changing his attitude towards children. Data also chooses, upon consultation with Geordi, to finally implant the emotion chip Dr. Soon created for him after removing it from lore in the TNG Season 7 premiere, Descent Part 2. He even takes it out for a test spin in a memorable sequence in 10 Forward. Oh, yes! I hate this! It is revolting! More? Please. But as we see throughout the film, Data struggles with these emotions more intensely than he ever did without them. Sir, I no longer want these emotions. This becomes especially apparent as Data is assigned to help investigate the cause of the attack 
on the Amargosa Observatory, where Soren is running an experiment to blow up the Amargosa star. He is successful, and this alters the course of the Nexus energy ribbon, his next stop being the Viridian system, where Soren plans to blow up that star as well and alter the Nexus's course again in hopes of returning to the Nexus. You see, the Nexus itself, as explained by Guinan, is like being inside joy. It's a dreamlike realm where all of one's deepest fantasies are realized, a sort of perfect simulation of one's desires. Guinan, Soren, and probably the other 45 survivors of the Lakul were ripped from the Nexus by the Enterprise B's transporters, pulling them from paradise back into a cold universe where their homeworld had just been ravaged by totalitarian cyborgs. And Soren is doing all of this with the help of the Duras sisters, who, as you might remember, lost the Klingon Civil War a few years prior. In exchange for providing Soren with trilithium to inhibit all nuclear fusion in the Amargosa and Viridian suns, the sisters are promised Soren's designs for a trilithium weapon that could help them overthrow the Klingon High Council. The Duras sisters figure out a way to bypass the Enterprise's shields and trigger a warp core breach, prompting the crew to evacuate the star drive section to the saucer section. The Enterprise destroys the sisters bird of prey, but after separating, the saucer is knocked by a prematurely exploding core, causing it to descend into Viridian 3's atmosphere. The saucer crash lands into the surface in a sequence of shots that, believe it or not, was actually filmed entirely practically with the scale model and landscape rather than using CGI. While all of this is going on, Picard finds a gap in Soren's force field, but is not quick enough to stop his destruction of Viridian altering the Nexus's path and sweeping up everyone on the planet's surface. Thus begins the film's third act, which is regarded by many to be this film's primary weakness. You see, for the first couple of decades of the Star Trek film franchise's existence, there was this unwritten rule of sorts, something of a fan and critical consensus that the even-numbered Star Trek films were stronger and the odd-numbered Star Trek films were weaker. For instance, The Wrath of Khan, The Voyage Home, The Undiscovered Country, and even First Contact are heralded as some of the best Trek films of all time, while the motion picture, The Search for Spock, The Final Frontier, Generations, and Insurrection have traditionally been considered to have more flaws. Star Trek Nemesis is considered to have broken the even-numbered rule, which we'll get to in a bit. Now, now, mind you, while I do have issues with the odd-numbered Star Trek films, I think that this rule is a little simplistic. Generations is kind of messy, but it's a fun mess, and to be honest, I've come to think of it as one of the most underrated films in the franchise. When I was younger and watching it for the first time, I didn't really get as much out of it, but as I've gotten older, I've come to appreciate it a lot more, and I think that this is a common sentiment that you will find among the fan base. That said, the third act is where a lot of the film's budgetary and time constraints start to come through. While Picard's nexus is a reflection of what we can tell he's wanted for years, a biological family, Kirk's nexus is a mishmash of seemingly random, disparate concepts, including a major one that comes out of left field his girlfriend Antonia, for whom Kirk actually quit Starfleet in the early 2280s before he was called back into service. As was pointed out in Trexpertise's video about the life of James T. Kirk, Antonia must have been the biggest knockout of all time to make Kirk, the man who dedicated his life to Starfleet, literally, quit the organization that was so fundamentally tied to his identity. Anyway, Picard solicits the help of Kirk to go back in time before Soren destroys the Viridian Sun, and Kirk sacrifices himself once again to make a difference. Fun fact, the original cut of Generations had Soren shoot Kirk in the back, but this death received such a negative response from test audiences that Paramount granted the production $5 million to reshoot the scene in the same location. Now, Kirk dying under a falling bridge is also still considered by many fans to be not quite the heroic out that the character deserves, and I'll admit that it hasn't exactly sat right with me over the years either. But time travel notwithstanding, it certainly is a more humbling death than the, in some ways, cliched going out in a blaze of glory. I've gotta say, I love this movie. Every time I watch it, it just gets better and better. But I do agree with the criticisms 
of the third act. Brannon Braga has stated that he and Moore simply were not given enough time to fully flesh out what Kirk's nexus could have and arguably should have been. This movie leaves an Antonia-shaped hole in Kirk's past, one that provides a hearty challenge for future writers who choose to take up its mantle. But as it stands, I think that Generations is an appropriate, if imperfect, epilogue for several members of the TOS cast, but a near-perfect introduction for the TNG characters to the big screen. That's it. Yeah. All right. That's the big screen part. To the big screen. Yeah. Life forms. You tiny little life forms. You precious little life forms. We have some uh, Blade Runner pop figures down here. Um, you know, the Dune books, first three Dune books, uh, and, uh, you know, Arrival and everything. Just references to, you know, Orville, like, references to various franchises that I've enjoyed over the years. And, um, you know, so this, oh is, God, this is a really? new background. Yeah. And if you follow me over, if you follow me over oh. here, before we go any further, I'd like to talk to you about today's sponsor, Factor. Factor makes meeting your nutrition goals easier than ever by delivering fresh, never frozen, dietitian approved meals right to your doorstep. Their team of gourmet chefs create each meal using only the best ingredients to help you feel your best all day long. Factor supports wholesome eating made simple. Their menus are updated weekly and include over 27 meals and 33 add-on options. Choose your favorites or let Factor craft your order based on your own taste preferences and meal history. Factor meals arrive pre-prepared and are ready to eat in two minutes, perfect for busy lifestyles. Factor's really flexible. I can adjust my order size, enjoy meals with family, or even skip a week when I have a special event. And Factor is now owned by HelloFresh, so with a wider array of meal plans, there's something for everyone. I really enjoyed switching between brands and now my viewers can enjoy both at a discount with me. Head to Factor75.com or click the link below and use code ORANGERIVER50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. Once again, go to Factor75.com or use the link below and use code ORANGERIVER50 to get 50% off your first box. Thanks to Factor for sponsoring this video. Now, let's get back to it. The box office success of Star Trek Generations, which grossed over $120 million worldwide, prompted Paramount to approach Berman in early 1995 in anticipation of the next Trek film installment. While meeting with Moore and Braga, Berman revealed that he was interested in pursuing a time travel story, but Moore and Braga wanted to do a story focusing on the Borg. The three then concluded they might as well do both. Time periods initially considered for the film, which did not yet have its final final title were the days of the Roman Empire, the American Civil War, and the Italian Renaissance. The Renaissance was eventually seized upon, with a draft script called Star Trek Renaissance being fleshed out. The film would have featured the crew searching for a time-traveling Borg in a feudal European village before tracking them down to a nobleman's castle. Data would have befriended Leonardo da Vinci, employed by the nobleman as a military engineer, and posed as da Vinci's apprentice. After realizing that combining phaser and sword fights in the same scenes risked becoming overly campy, plus the fact that such a film would be too expensive to produce, the writers and producers changed the setting to the late 21st century. Utilizing lore elements originally conceived by Gene Roddenberry in the TOS episode Metamorphosis, the subsequent draft very closely resembled the final film with a few exceptions. Titled Star Trek Resurrection, this version of the film would have seen Zephram Cochran severely injured in the Borg attack on his Montana complex. Picard would take his place in history and fall in love with a local photographer and x-ray technician named Ruby, while Riker would stay aboard the Enterprise to fight the Borg drones. The Borg Queen was also not in this draft. While receiving generally positive notes from Paramount, one executive felt the Borg were too weak, 
basically being zombies, leading the writers to create the Borg Queen. While the Borg Queen has been a rather divisive character, seemingly at odds with the franchise's previous portrayal of the Borg as a decentralized collective, she was viewed as a logical extension of the Borg's existing insect-like qualities. Patrick Stewart also suggested that Picard and Riker's stories be switched, and elements like Ruby and the injured Cochrane were ultimately scrapped as well. This also allowed Cochrane's character to be better fleshed out, which Moore considered to be one of the best changes they made. In his words, it said something about the birth of the Federation that the future Gene Roddenberry envisioned is born from a very flawed man who is not larger than life, but an ordinary human being. Interestingly, the casting department tried to get Tom Hanks to play Cochrane, and Hanks was interested being a self-avowed Trekkie, but was too busy with his big screen directorial debut, That Thing You Do. Still titled Star Trek Resurrection, the eighth Star Trek film marked the directorial debut of Jonathan Frakes, who recruited a mix of Trek behind-the-scenes vets as well as outside talent to bring the production to life. Robert Blackman in particular returned to design the Starfleet uniforms, this time to complement Frakes' darker color palette. These uniforms would go on to appear as well in Deep Space Nine, starting with the mid-fifth season through to the end of that show's run. While I definitely have a soft spot for the prior uniforms, I really like these uniforms' incorporation of gray shoulders. It's very distinct and serves as a metaphor for the gray areas that Star Trek, particularly DS9, often explore, like committing war crimes. You betrayed your uniform! And you're betraying yours, right now! First Contact is also the first Trek film to feature the Sovereign class Enterprise E, and like generations before it, the film features a clever mix of both practical effects and CGI. Even a month after production began, the film was still titled Resurrection before finally being changed to its final form. First Contact is, in many ways, a spiritual successor to the best of both worlds, exploring Picard's PTSD and other lingering effects of his assimilation. Mere minutes into the film, we bear witness to the Battle of Sector 001, a full-fledged Borg invasion of the Soul System, where they are implementing a new speedrun strat to conquer humanity, traveling back in time to the past and preventing first contact with the Vulcans. The Enterprise is joined in combat by the tough little Defiant, Little, before Worf leaves Ben Wyatt to join his former comrades. The E follows a Borg sphere through a temporal vortex, Time travel, and destroys it in orbit of 2063 Earth but not before it can cripple Cochrane's complex. Cochrane's right-hand engineer, Lily Sloan, exclaims, It's an Eka! A reference to the Eastern Coalition of Nations, one of the factions in World War III, which had concluded ten years prior. Picard and an away team beam down to Cochrane's missile silo, where they observe his prototype warp ship, the Phoenix, has suffered only minor damage. Picard remarks about the historical irony of the Titan II rocket used in World War III to launch nuclear missiles being used instead to usher in an era of peace and prosperity. The film features a number of Easter eggs, including the emergency medical hologram, a Dixon Hill hollow program with Ethan Phillips, aka Neelix, as a holographic Mater D, <laughs> get Mater D, get her done, and a cameo by Lieutenant Barkley among others. After Picard and Data beam back up to the Enterprise with a fainted Lily, she and Picard, along with Worf and Crusher, must navigate the Borg-infested ship while Data is captured and enticed by the Dominatrix Borg Queen. I am fully functional, programmed in multiple techniques. Played by South African-born actress Alice Krieger. Is that good for you? After calming Lily down, Picard explains the economics of the future. Money doesn't exist in the 24th century. No money? You mean you don't get paid? The acquisition of wealth is no longer the driving force in our lives. We work to better ourselves and the rest of humanity. While on the surface, Riker, Troy, and Geordi convince Cochrane to go through with his warp flight. And you people, you're all astronauts on some kind of Star Trek. 
Hey, that's the name of the show. While first contact is derided by some as being when the franchise started to go too far in the action flick direction, and it is admittedly easy to get a bit lost in the third act's major set piece featuring the board queen's death, I still think that First Contact is a strong film for several reasons. For one thing, the action just works. I don't know what else to tell you guys. I mean, not all of these movies have to be slow and cerebral like the motion picture. Shots fired. And secondly, it all goes back to what Moore said. First Contact gives us a glimpse into Earth's past that has been hinted at, but never really fleshed out until this film. Sure, we know about Cochrane's accomplishments from Metamorphosis, and we see an example of the post-atomic horror in Encounter at Farpoint and All Good Things, but seeing the seeds of this utopian post-scarcity society emerging from the ashes of World War III and being ushered in by an alcoholic motivated by money it's poetic in a way. Again, it's like poetry, it's sort of they rhyme. But as far as the TNG crew, well, they've got their share of demons as well. You want to destroy the ship and run away, you coward. John Luke. If you were any other man, I would kill you where you stand. The Borg are the white whale to Picard's Ahab, and Lily calling out John Luke's bullshit about having an evolved sensibility as he damn near enjoys killing Borg drones including assimilated crew members of his, is probably the best scene in the film. John, look, blow up the damn ship! No! No! In fact, I think this back and forth exchange between Lily and Picard in the observation lounge may be one of the most important scenes in the entire franchise. For as much as these 24th century humans talk about how they've evolved past petty things like greed, revenge, etc., take them out of their element and they're just as savage as humans have always been. This is a sentiment that is echoed in various episodes of DS9, with observations from alien characters like Quark, a Ferengi personification of 20th and 21st century human greed, who nevertheless is put off by humans' sometimes hypocritical, self-righteous attitudes. They're a wonderful, friendly people, as long as their bellies are full and their hollow sweets are working. But take away their creature comforts, deprive them of food, sleep, sonic showers, put their lives in jeopardy over an extended period of time, and those same friendly, intelligent, wonderful people will become as nasty and as violent as the most bloodthirsty Klingon. That's why I think First Contact is a great film. It further demonstrates that if an era of peace can be made possible by a man like Cochrane, then maybe there's hope for our species in the real world as well. But if you like that message, that technology and human ingenuity can help us achieve great things, you might have a problem with the next film on the list. I gotta take a leak. Leak? I'm not detecting any leak. Don't you people from the 24th century ever pee? This is something that, that a lot of people haven't seen before. So uh, these are Hot Wheels toys or, or Hot Wheels models, right? And um, when I was young, I played with them like they were toys and I broke the stands. So I don't display these in my videos. I, I broke my little ships, you know? You broke your little ships. And, um, Development of Star Trek Insurrection began in early 1997, when Berman and Paramount approached TNG veteran writer and producer Michael Piller for story ideas. Moore and Braga were occupied with their work on DS9 and Voyager, as well as Mission Impossible 2. Having found First Contact to be too dark, Piller wanted the ninth Star Trek film to be lighter in tone. He lamented what he felt was a shift in the American public's viewing habits towards darker sci-fi and wanted to shift the franchise back to the proverbial box Gene Roddenberry had put previous writers in as an intellectual challenge. For the story itself, Pillar was inspired by his own experience with aging and began to craft a plot around the search for the Fountain of Youth. This is starting to become kind of a trope, like all these Star Trek films, even some of the good ones being like about getting old. I mean, it, that that's kind of getting old. Already, from my perspective, things are starting to get off track. While Roddenberry's original vision was, of course, pivotal, as I have demonstrated throughout this retrospective series, 
TNG got better and better the less involved he was with it. And since his death, Trek has undoubtedly explored darker stories and themes, but arguably Insurrection goes too far in the lighthearted direction, as we'll explore in a minute. Anyway, in the first draft of the script, titled Star Trek Stardust, Picard must track down a former Starfleet Academy classmate named Duffy, who is attacking Romulan ships in the far reaches of space. As the crew pursues Duffy, they start to get younger and younger as they approach the Fountain of Youth powers of the Briar Patch. Berman found the film to be too fantasy-like, and the second draft also featured Picard in pursuit of Data, an element that would remain in the final film. In this second draft, Picard kills Data in the second act, but reactivates him in time to save the Federation from an unholy alliance with the Romulans. Ultimately, Patrick Stewart was dissatisfied with the script, and thank God, because that all that sounds horrible. As were studio executives. Stewart wanted Picard to be more in jeopardy throughout the script and to have a romantic interest. He was also enthusiastic about the Fountain of Youth storyline, which was reintroduced into the third draft. The conflict with Data was scaled back to just the first act, and the script introduced new villains called the Sony. <laughs> Yeah, I can see why they changed that. Victimizing the Baku, a race of children. After DS9 executive producer Ira Steven Bear gave Pillar a negative review of the script, the Baku were changed. <laughs> Everybody's like, Michael, stop. The Baku were changed to adults, allowing for the introduction of the character Anij as a love interest for Picard. How old are you? The Sony became the Sona and were made more gruesome, and the title was changed to Insurrection. Freaks would return to direct while Industrial Light and Magic, busy with work on Star Wars Episode I, The Phantom Menace, was replaced with Blue Sky and Santa Barbara Studios to do the visual effects. Unlike Generations and First Contact, the vast majority of the effects shots were digital rather than practical, with physical model photography limited primarily to the explosion of the Sona collector ship. At the same time, though, Insurrection used the most built sets of any Trek film up to that point, as widespread use of digital sets was still a few years away. One of these physical sets was the cave on Baku, which doubled as a cave set used throughout DS9, including as the Bajoran fire caves in the finale, What You Leave Behind. Insurrection is rather unique as Star Trek films go, and unfortunately, I don't mean that in a positive way. We open on the idyllic planet of Baku as a seemingly pre-industrial society is being observed by a Federation scientist science team. After Data goes rogue, exposing the duck blind the science team is using, it appears that Data has broken the Prime Directive. But as we'll soon find out, it isn't as simple as that. On the Enterprise, Picard and his senior staff prepare for a diplomatic banquet with the Federation's newest protectorate, a recently warp-capable race called the Evora. This sequence is shot like the cold open of an episode of The West Wing, and I like the lore drops about the Federation seeking as many allies as they can in light of the Dominion War. Insurrection doesn't have a star date, but we know it's at least concurrent with DS9's final season. As the Enterprise closes in and arrives on Baku to investigate why Data went rogue, Riker and Troy rekindle their long dormant romance. Worf gets a pimple. Geordi can finally see a sunrise with his own eyes, and Troy and Crusher find their boobs are firmer than they used to be. And have you noticed how your boobs have started to firm up? We find out that the Baku are a warp-capable species who have since abandoned technology in favor of this weird, hippie, new-age pastoral lifestyle. Okay, they haven't abandoned technology, but they don't implement it in their daily lives, which effectively is the same thing. I'm not against toasters, I just don't have one. <laughs> but as much as I've made fun of the Baku so far, they are pivotal to both of the film's chief themes, one of which I still find detestable, but the other I find to be far more agreeable. I'll focus on the latter first. Essentially, the Federation is in cahoots with the Sona to forcibly relocate the 600 Baku on their planet to harvest the metaphysic particles in the planet's rings. Why must they be relocated? Well, the procedure the Sona have developed to collect the particles requires the injection of a substance that initiates a thermolytic reaction, 
which would render the planet uninhabitable for decades. As many have pointed out, not sure why they couldn't just set up clinics on the surface, but whatever. While the medical technologies that could be created from this process would save billions, the question the film poses is, is it worth moving 600 people from their home? Picard asks Admiral Doherty, what number does it take before it becomes wrong, invoking parallels with the Atlantic slave trade, Indian removal, and more. In theory, I do agree with the spirit of this argument, although there is a legitimate question in my mind as to whether the Baku deserve the same level of sympathy. Seriously. What? But I thought you said that you thought the Trail of Tears was a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, for one, think the Trail of Tears was a bad thing! You see, Baku is not their native homeworld, although it is where they've lived for 300 years. The ring's metaphasic properties regenerate the Baku's cells and keep them from aging, physically, past roughly their late 30s. And we find out that the Sona and Baku are actually the same species. The Sona, decades earlier, were exiled for rebelling against their parents' Luddite society. Now, the Sona aren't good guys either. They're thuggish and have subjugated other races into a caste society. Plus, they'd kill their own parents if push came to shove. But the Baku, despite being portrayed as an idyllic society, really just rubbed me the wrong way. It really grinds my gears, Lois. <laughs> okay. <laughs> They're not Native Americans being told to give up their lands for white settlers. They're NIMBYs sitting on a cure for cancer. All in all, I think Star Trek Insurrection fumbles its themes big time. In principle, forcible relocation is wrong, but... Famous last words. <laughs> Insurrection muddies the waters with its exploration of its other main theme, the one I hinted at earlier the horrors of technology. I can't remember where the first place was that I saw this, but for years there's been a common critique of insurrection that has lived rent-free in my head. Get out of my head! Get out of my head! Get out of my head, man! Get out of my head! Don't be with your head! Get out of my head! head. No, no. Basically, it's the idea that insurrection is ultimately a betrayal of everything that Star Trek stands for, because the film, inadvertently or not, promotes an anti-technology message. By presenting the admittedly flawed but still pacifistic Arcadian Baku as the victims in this situation and the good guys as a foil to the technologically advanced Sona and the Federation, the film is essentially saying technology bad. Whoa. I got that out in one, <laughs> one go. Statements by the Baku about how technology takes away from the dignity of work are treated as factual truisms rather than neo-transcendentalist nonsense. We believe that when you create a machine to do the work of a man, you take something away from the man. Not to get too political, but it's one thing to comment on the alienation of labor under capitalism. It's another to say, let's just go back to before the Industrial Revolution actually f***ing liberated us from backbreaking peasant labor. I'm sorry y'all, but this is not what Star Trek is about. Star Trek has always been humanist, but also technologically progressive. It's always shown how technology can help us accomplish great things while still setting limits, like how the Borg, the pinnacle of integration with technology, are a warning against going too far, and a metaphor for authoritarianism. Those things are not contradictory, but the Baku are an oddity that kind of turns the universe on its head. Insurrection reminds me of a worse version of the season 7 episode Homeward, in which Worf's brother Nikolai helps relocate a pre-warp society from their dying homeworld to a new planet. There's even a plot to use a holodeck environment to fool both races in each installment. Except, again, the Baku aren't pre-warp. And one of the other biggest criticisms of Insurrection is that it feels like an extra-long TNG episode rather than a proper feature film. Now, feature-length episodes can be done right, which is why I think that format and vibe works for a film like Star Trek Beyond. But Insurrection just fails on so many levels. <laughs> In fact, on my last rewatch of it before this retrospective, I couldn't even finish it. I, I just thought it was so boring. I got through it this time, but let me just tell you, it gets worse from here. 
his energetic fists should be ready to resist a dictatorial word. Sing, Wolf, sing. Here we have an equipment shelf, um, you know. We got some, uh, we got the, the, the boys in, in gold and blue, you know, the Kelvin timeline figures, um, some more pop figures and books over here, um, and uh, yeah, that's, and then here's my, my actual recording setup, you know, with my lights and my camera and mics and laptop and, and all that stuff, and uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed that, that little studio tour. Star Trek Nemesis is one of the Star Trek films of all time. The final film in the TNG movie series, Nemesis is directed by Stuart Baird, based on a script by John Logan. It's also the first Star Trek film not to feature opening credits, which fell out of practice in most major Hollywood films by the early 2000s. It begins with a coup d'etat against the Romulan Senate by the forces of Shinzon, a clone of Picard played by Tom Hardy, who grew up in the dilithium mines of Romulus' sister planet, Remus. Shinzon has the support of much of the Romulan military, and he plans to use a Thaleron weapon to attack Earth. Hold on, I, I said Thaleron like, like it was like you all knew what that was. And he plans to use a Thaleron weapon to attack Earth. In Alaska, Picard gives a toast at Riker and Troy's wedding reception, and among the attended guests is Wesley Crusher, who's apparently taken a break from exploring other planes of existence with the Traveler. We learn that after the crew attends a second ceremony on Beta Z, Riker and Troy are due to transfer to the USS Titan, of which Riker has accepted command. But the Enterprise picks up a positronic signal emanating from B4 another one of Dr. Soong's creations on Kolaris 3. We get the now infamous scene of Picard driving erratically in a dune buggy, apparently an addition of Stewart's into the script, of, of Patrick Stewart's, not Stuart Baird. I, I, don't, I don't know what he thought about that. I guess, he, I guess he thought enough of it to put it in the film. I will always be puzzled by the human predilection for piloting vehicles at unsafe velocities. <laughs> Shinzon wants to meet with Picard to discuss a new alliance, but really, he wants Picard's blood because he's a vampire. Uh, no, it's because he needs Picard's DNA to keep him alive. You see, for those of you who've watched my channel for years, you'll know that the cloning process is very imperfect. There's a lot that can go wrong. Sometimes you get clones who think AOC wants to ban cows. I read it in Breitbart. Clones who think Disney hacked into their computer and stole their idea for Zootopia. It's true. Mickey Mouse will pay. Clones who had one hit single and won't let it die. Man, my fans loved Freaky Fast Subs. Gonna serve you all day. Free smells, free <laughs> Clones who won't stop telling you about the new epic champions you can get in Raid Shadow Legends. Not a sponsor. Clones who go rogue and threaten to derail your entire mission from the Interstellar Alliance. The list goes on and on. Where was I? Uh, oh yes, Star Trek. This film, for some bizarre reason, lowers the pitch of Worf's voice to make him sound more alien. As if Michael Dorn's voice wasn't perfect already, and as if the forehead makeup didn't do the job just as fine. I am picking up an unusual electromagnetic signature from the Kalaran system. What sort of signature? Positronic. We get a cameo from Admiral Janeway, as well as a picture of young Picard at the Academy, inexplicably bald even though he had a full head of hair as a cadet in Tapestry. Nemesis does do some things right, I'll admit. One of Shinzon's biggest contentions with Picard's point of view is that if Picard had lived Shinzon's life, he might make the same choices as Shinzon. It's the classic nature versus nurture argument bolstered by the fact that Picard and Shinzon are genetically the same person. But Shinzon is a fucking maniac, an over-the-top villain, so at the same time, I kind of don't care about his motivation. It's power and revenge, plain and simple. Shinzon, likely cloned from a hair follicle or other DNA fragment to conduct espionage against the Federation, was probably born in the 2350s. But his entire character is just so uninteresting that it's hard for me to stay awake. I mean, seriously. Also, in the 2350s, the Romulan Empire was in isolation, so this would have been when Picard was captain of the Stargazer. I, I do not know if they gave it that much thought. Probably not. And even if Shinzon himself weren't the TNG movie series jumping the shark, 
Well, my dear viewers, that moment definitely comes by the 51 minute mark. When Picard asks Deanna to endure continued telepathic sexual assault by Shinzon and the Riemann Viceroy in order to gain intel. Shinzon's Viceroy seems to have the ability to reach into my thoughts. I've become a liability. I request to be relieved of my duties. Permission denied. If you can endure more of these assaults, I need you at my side, now more than ever. What is this, the fourth, fifth, sixth time that Troy has been mind raped in the series? This is something that Picard would never do, and it just, it just broke my disbelief so fucking hard, dude. So fucking hard. This doesn't feel right. Shinzon's plan is of course thwarted. His life is ended by Picard, on whom Data places an emergency transporter device that beams him out so Data can destroy the Thaleron weapon, which in turn takes his life. Data's memory engrams have been transferred into B4, but as we learned in Star Trek Picard, B4's less advanced neurocircuitry ultimately prevents Data's personality from being fully resurrected inside B4's body. An amalgam of Data's consciousness, plus that of lore, B4, Lol, and Soong is ultimately transferred into a new hybrid organic synthetic body in Picard Season 3. Marina Sirtis and LeVar Burton are on record as having said that they thought Star Trek Nemesis sucked. Sirtis, however, thought it sucked less than Insurrection, and she has since made further critical statements of Baird, calling him an idiot and criticizing him for not watching a single episode of TNG. Baird also reportedly thought Geordi was an alien and called LeVar Laverne throughout production. In fact, Nemesis was so damaging to the franchise that it, along with the poor ratings for Star Trek Enterprise, led Paramount in 2005 to cancel all live-action Star Trek projects set in the Prime Universe indefinitely, sell large swaths of props and costumes and auctions, and dial down the production of official merchandise. It would be another 10 years before another Prime Universe production, Star Trek Discovery, was announced. In the meantime, however, Paramount contacted Roberto Orsi and Alex Kurtzman for ideas to revive the franchise, resulting in the 2009 Star Trek reboot directed by J.J. Abrams and set in the Kelvin timeline. Despite all this though, the legacy of Nemesis still remains with us. The 2009 Star Trek film ramps up the Romulan coup's consequences by destroying Romulus altogether, as seen in Spock's mind meld with alternate James T. Kirk. This, in turn, influenced the plot of the first season of Picard, which premiered in 2020 and features the Romulan diaspora as an analog to our world's Syrian refugee crisis. And then they did nothing with that storyline, which is one of my biggest gripes with the season. Well, my friends, that is the troublesome tale of the TNG films. <laughs> We finally made it. We finally made it. <laughs> From the flawed but promising start of Generations, to the height of First Contact, to the boring droll of Insurrection, to the crash and burn of Nemesis, they certainly tried. For my official assessment, I can confidently say that I think that the TNG movies are mostly not that great. They definitely pale in comparison to the TOS movies, which I would love to cover at some point on my channel. But the TNG films were incredibly consequential, making major contributions to the overall lore of the Trek universe and advancing character relationships. The Dura sisters meet their bitter end, Kirk's fate is confirmed, Geordi gets ocular implants, details of World War III and First Contact are fleshed out, Will and Deanna finally end up together like they always should have been, we meet another one of Dr. Soong's prototype androids, and a government shakeup fundamentally alters the course of Romulan and thus galactic history. And while most fans have massive problems with, in particular, Insurrection and Nemesis, at least we get to see some more adventures with some of our favorite characters. As usual, characters like Dr. Crusher could have been given more to do, but overall, these films do some kind of job bridging the gap between the next generation itself and the post-Voyager galaxy showcased in Picard, Lower Decks, and Prodigy. I've always enjoyed First Contact and think that Generations mostly breaks the odd-numbered rule, but if there's anything that I have to thank Insurrection and Nemesis for, it's leading Paramount to fire Rick Berman and start the f*** over. As for the next Trek retrospective series on the channel, well, I'm still deciding. I have quite a few options. With that, thank you all so much for watching. 
If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash orange river, link in the description, or become a YouTube member by clicking the join button on my channel page. And I just want to give a quick shout out to all of my donors who allow me to bring on talent like editors to help make more high quality content for you to enjoy. By becoming a patron or member, you also get access to awesome perks like behind the scenes photos and videos, patron and member only polls, name in the credits, merch discounts, and more. Or you can drop a one-time super for thanks or PayPal donation. All are appreciated. Links to my PayPal as well as my social media and merch store are in the description too. That's all I have for this week. Live long and prosper. Wee, it's good to be back. Hey guys, Tyler here. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, let's let's take a let's take a take a minute. <laughs> that's okay. a that's a good app take. I just, <laughs> I just wasn't prepared for that. And a near perfect introduction for the TNG characters to the big screen. Did my voice crack a little there? Big screen. One, yeah. Thank you all so much for watching. God. <laughs> I'm falling apart. Falling apart, Lisa. <laughs> Before we dive in, I need to address the elephant in the room. Okay, I closed my eyes. <laughs> Before we dive in, I need to address the elephant in the room. Hey, Horton. Okay, he, his ears were flopping around. <laughs> I guess this is going to be like a cadicorous thing oh, where we yeah. just like do it a million times until we get it right. Live long and prosper. <laughs> 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 you stupid cat. <laughs>